What we have to prove on our side of the House is not a defense of every single intervention that has ever been associated with feminism. What we have to prove on our side of the House is that there are instances in which feminist causes can be furthered by military interventions and that in those instances, feminists should be fervent and vocal advocates for that. And that's what we're proud to stand for on our side. There are two sections to my speech today. The first section asks, why is it that we need interventions sometimes? The second section asks, what happens when we say that we when we say that we don't need interventions and when we remove gender from the discourse that arises around the kinds of crises that we're talking about in this debate. To begin with, why is it that we need interventions? We brought you a number of reasons in Malena's speech that have not really been adequately responded to. The first thing we told you is that they can end civil violence, right? And that often civil violence is particularly sexualized. We heard from this side of the house that sometimes when militaries intervene, the violence that they commit is also sexualized, right? That sometimes when militaries come in, you have have like unfortunate incidences of rape. That is definitely true. And on our side of the house, we don't want to try to claim, no thank you, that no military has ever like illegitimately committed sexual violence, right? But the thing is that when you look at the incentives, we think that there are significant reasons why sexual violence is much worse in situations where you have oppressive regimes and when you have civil violence than in instances where you have a military intervention. The reason is because in instances where there's a military intervention, that happens like as isolated incidents because there are some bad people who are in the military, right? Whereas on the other hand, when you have it occurring within civil violence, um, and in the cases of civil wars, the reason why it's happening is because it is like systematically used as a way to humiliate an opposing identity group, right? That's the reason why you see it occurring like systematically and on a massive scale as a tool of warfare in the kinds of instances where we want to intervene to try to protect the women who are going to be victims in those situations. No, thank you. The next thing we told you is that you're able to replace oppressive regimes and that oppressive regimes really disproportionately harm women, right? What did we hear from this side of the house about, about that? Firstly, they said no. they didn't want to talk about Afghanistan, and that was the only example that they used, right? They were like, well, look at, Af look at Afghanistan. It's still like incredibly bad for women there. Yes, that's obviously true, but you guys are like entirely ignoring the utter horror of the situation before, right? Like the story of Malala, for example, is absolutely tragic, but do you think she would ever have been on a school bus on her way to a school if there had never been a US intervention in Afghanistan? Absolutely not, right? That's the reason why we think that when you start to replace oppressive regimes, that's when you're able to start to dismantle the kinds of laws these um, regimes have in place that disproportionately harm women. No, thank you. The next thing we told you is that when you bring about regime change, you're able to draft new constitutions in these countries, right? Those constitutions are much more likely, therefore, to be secular, they're much more likely to involve robust human rights protections and to like guarantee franchise and things like that to women, they're much more likely to be building the kind of civil infrastructure that provides health and provides education and other things that disproportionately help women in the long term, right? The only other thing we heard from this side of the house in response to this was that it's really bad when we go in and tell these people what feminism means because it's like a totally westernized conception. We think that the kind of basic freedoms that we're usually trying to bring about on our side of the house are not things that are particularly contentious, right? We think that by and large, the idea that we want to have less war rape and we want to have less oh. systematic exclusion from social life, no thank you, are things that are fairly universal, right? We think that, that moreover though, the benefits that we bring about, the things, like his, um, the things like secular constitutions and the things like robust human rights protections and franchise for women, are then the things that start to empower more local, more organic feminist groups, right? On we this. think that's, no thank you. Um, we think that that's the reason why um, none of the responses that are provided in terms of making life worse for women in interventions hold in this debate. What I want to move on to now is the ways that, no thank you, the ways in which um, we think this is incredibly harmful, um, incredibly harmful to the way we talk about women's issues in, um, in, in crises. And there's a few reasons for this. The first one is that it delegitimizes women's issues in comparison to all other issues, right? So it says that things like war rape or things like the systematic exclusion of women from public life are less important than security concerns or than resource disputes or than whatever any of the other reasons why we might intervene in one of these, uh, in one of these countries are. With, see, moreover though, that like not seeing these things as equal is something that has like an incredibly long history, right? So the Arusha Tribunal about Rwanda, which happened in 2006, was the first time that rape was like recognized as a crime of war, right? We think that that's egregious and we think that that comes from the exclusion of feminist concerns in like the consideration of wars, which is something that we really oppose on our side. No, thank you. 
The next thing we told you, um, sorry, the next thing that we want to tell you about this, right, is that when you start, when you decouple feminist movements from interventions, that discourages feminist organizations from being involved with the military in any way, right? And there's a number of ways that they might be doing this that are incredibly helpful in these situations. So firstly, they might be providing social services and outreach. They're like in association with, um, in association with the military or working with the military to deliver those services, right? We think that's really important and we think that when you're going to be villainized and demonized by the feminist movement, movement for doing that, you're less likely to. Secondly, we think that like feminist journalists, so journalists from feminist organizations, are less likely to be embedded with military groups for the same reason, and that means that we don't get their reporting coming out of these situations. Thirdly, we think that monitoring the situation of women is something that a lot of these organizations do that they then feed back to military in incredibly useful ways. I'll tell you a little story about Sierra Leone right after we hear from this team. First of all, Malala's Pakistani. Secondly, in civil war, uh, civil, we don't intervene in the cases of civil wars and those that are especially bad for women because we go to war when it is the interest of, in the interest of elites who tend to be dominated by men and by military decision makers, so they don't consider those interests apparent. Okay, but our point is that sometimes we should go to war when it is in the interest of women, and also sometimes in the situations that you're talking about, it may be the case that it's in the interest of elites for various reasons, and also in the interest of the local women. We, as we said, outside of the house don't have to defend every single intervention that's ever occurred, right? What I want to tell you about Sierra Leone is really important. What it is is that m the monitoring of the role that women are playing in warfare is something that is particularly crucial to the to the rebuilding afterwards. So one of the things that happened in Sierra Leone was there were a huge number of female insurgents, right, who became members of various militias. But after the war, because there was an assumption that women tended not to be members of militias, women who were associated with these groups were mostly categorized by the UN as being either sex slaves or being prisoners of war, even when they had in fact been members of the military. That meant that they were excluded from all of the services and all of the skills building that was made available to women, to, sorry, that was made available to men who had been soldiers because of the fact that there was an assumption that they were not going to be playing that role. We've proven to you that interventions can be better for women. We've proven that feminists need to be vocal about the need for intervention. Oppressed women across the world need the support of the free world, and we are very proud to propose this motion.